First, I want to talk about a particular experiment that was done, um, just to highlight this point a little bit more formally. So this is uh, an experiment that is often, uh, that's been run a bunch of times. And the idea is participants are asked to explain, just to state, the, the line on the left, which line does it match most closely on the right in terms of length? And if I ask you guys, you'll probably mostly say C. C. Now, if I were running this experiment, I'd be really evil, and I would actually have everybody in the room working for me except one of you. And everybody in the room except for you would have been told to answer A. And we'd go around the room and each person would say A. There might be a little bit of variability, but most everybody would give a wrong answer. And then we'd come to you. And under that pressure of, of social conformity, many of you would actually give the wrong answer, even though you knew it was the wrong answer. So in these types of experiments, um, in any given trial, a third of people will give the incorrect answer. And over repeated trials, eventually three quarters of all people will give the incorrect answer. And this has been tested really recently by neuroscientists putting people into MRI machines and measuring what's going on in their brain when they're participating in this type of experiment. And what we notice is when people are not given the social information, so they're just free to give their own answer, the parts of the brain that are activated are the parts that are associated with just normal cognition and problem solving. Um, when the participant has been given this incorrect information about their community having given an incorrect response, and then they're asked to respond, and they respond incorrectly, caving to this social pressure, not only are they doing this information processing and, and cognitive processing, parts of the brain that are involved with emotion also become activated. So this kind of clues us in to the fact that social pressure, giving into social pressure and this urge to conform is inherently very emotional. It's something about our you know, need to feel like part of a community um, in a very emotionally driven way that leads to this effect. So that's kind of informative when people are um, sort of trying to fit in with their community, it's an emotional response. So let's think about um, other implications. Lots of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point, in which he popularized the idea that once um, a social movement becomes accepted by about 20% of the population, it picks up momentum and becomes um, much more readily accepted by the remainder of the people in the population. More recent research has actually dug into that a little bit more deeply. And this big fuzzy set of diagrams is meaning to suggest that um, when only 10% of a population holds a particular sort of contentious opinion, um, over time, it can gain traction. And eventually, most of the population can ascribe to that particular view. And so to me, that's kind of encouraging because, you know, we have this notion that around 10% of the population is vegetarian. And so if we just keep pushing, there is hope that these sorts of ideas will become even more mainstream than they already are. So there's science to support this view. And I think that's really cool. Pushing this a little bit, you guys might ask, like, so, you know, we're part of the 10% that thinks we should all go veg. There's another 10% that thinks everybody should go on the Atkins diet. So, you know, which of those two opposing social forces is going to follow this time series? And I mean, that's an open question. I don't think science really addresses that. So I think we need to rely on lots of other tactics to help push this momentum along. And uh, I'm hoping that some of the ideas that I will talk about today will give us more fuel to keep the social movement gaining momentum and hopefully uh, catching on the way this sort of research suggests it should. Okay, so our, I want to go through a couple of recent examples of, yes? Isn't it true that this pressure, you gave either an entertaining or a neutral description of this, but isn't it true that if we're kicking the dog, more people are likely to kick the dog if they see me kicking the 
know? Well, and this is the two extremes of the spectrum that I'm talking about. It doesn't have to be a good thing that catches on. Absolutely. No, I agree. The other, I mean, it could be 10% of people thinking that the Atkins diet is good and consuming lots and lots of meat. So when you've got, you know, two competing forces, I, I can't, science doesn't tell you, I can't tell you which one is going to be the prevalent, the prevailing one, um, which is why I think we need to rely on other tactics to help move the one that is for the greater social good along, <laughs> you know. Can I just ask people to uh, hold the questions until the lecture is finished? Oh, okay. Hi, Mark, by the way. <laughs> Okay, so um, a couple of examples I want to go through. One of them, I'm sure uh, you've probably seen all over Facebook recently. Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, I happen to have a brother who is gay, and so maybe I have seen more of this than some other people have. But this is a logo. It's a modification of a logo from the Human Rights Campaign, which is a group in the U.S. that advocates for equality regardless of, you know, your um, sexual identity and they recently took their logo and turned it into a pink and red logo and encouraged everybody to make it their Facebook profile picture. And the reason they did this was to raise awareness about a Supreme Court decision that's coming up on the Defense of Marriage Act. So, you know, the Supreme Court right now is making a decision that will be very important for people who don't happen to be heterosexual. And so human rights campaign decided to um, just sort of flood Facebook with this logo. And there was some criticism that this was a really meaningless way to express your view, mm -hmm. that it's you know kind of armchair activism and armchair activism is completely useless. I have a different view. I think that when we take a controversial point of view, maybe this isn't as controversial a point of view as some, but when you take a point of view that some people still have strong disbelief in and you make it apparent that lots of people in your community actually are adopting that view, it can be very powerful. And so a simple sea of logos on Facebook can make people more aware that a particular point of view is becoming more prevalent. And so I happen to think this is a really good use of using social pressure to further a really positive end. And um, so it's one example that comes to mind. Another example that comes to mind is also from Facebook, but it's quite different. And in this one, Facebook actually performed a psychological experiment on every American who uses Facebook, who happened to log on to Facebook on the day of the last presidential election. So they didn't actually pre-announce this. Afterwards, there was a little bit of discussion about this, but let me describe the experiment to you. So first of all, there was a control group that didn't receive any message pertaining to the election directly from Facebook, okay? And this group had 600,000 people in it. The next group, was the first experimental group, Gesundheit. And they saw an ad from Facebook, 60 million people, 60 million Americans in the US who logged onto Facebook that day, saw a neutral message that just said, get out the vote and gave you an opportunity to click a button if you actually voted that day, okay? Another group, experimental group number two, saw an ad that embedded information that communicated which of your friends had actually clicked the I voted today button. And the ad um, looked like this. It was seen by 600,000 people. So um, here's the um, I voted button that both group one and group two saw, but only group two saw this bottom panel that had pictures of and the names of people in your network who had actually voted on that day. And Facebook was interested in figuring out what impact this had on voter turnout. And um, they probably had a fairly good idea of how most people would vote. Like, there's no way to anticipate how people are going to vote, but they probably have some idea of political leanings of, of people um, who are um, users of Facebook. But in any case, they, I think they claim that this was meant to be politically neutral. But the interesting thing is that they estimated that just by having done this experiment, around 60,000 more people voted than would otherwise have voted. 
And they also estimated that in this group right here, the ones who saw this message about their friends, an additional 280,000 people voted. So for every extra person who voted, ostensibly because of this campaign, four extra people voted because of this particular mes message about the social network. So this, again, to me, really highlights the potential power of harnessing this urge people have to conform in a social sense for the greater good, the greater social good. Um, now I just want to walk through a mock-up that is meant to be really heavy-handed um, just to demonstrate a point. So imagine two campaign messages now getting back to the animal rights campaigning space. So uh, campaign one has this message. So lots of people eat animal products even though doing so causes environmental damage, animal suffering, and adverse human health outcomes. This is bad. Don't eat animal products. That's a message that, you know, we've seen versions of this many, many times promoted by lots and lots of different not-for-profits and charities um, in the U.S. and Canada. Another way of conveying the same information that has quite a different spin, the majority of your neighbors have cut back on their consumption of animal products, helping the environment, animals, and their health. Um, so in this message, you know, we're conveying the same information about environment, animals, and health, and we're sort of implying that you know this is this is good, and lots of people doing it is bad. Um, it's not so much the positive versus negative spin that I want to focus on, though. It's the reference to community here, and it's the notion that by describing what lots of people are doing in a good way, that you know lots of people are doing this thing, and you should be like them. It can actually help sway people's uh, behavior. And I have built on this in some work that I've done myself. So I will elaborate on that shortly. Um, the next concept I want to talk about is choice architecture, also known as nudging. And some of you might have come across this concept. Um, in the animal kingdom, you know, humans aren't the only ones who engage in nudging behavior. Here we see mama elephant trying to encourage baby elephant to do something that she wants to do by just kind of nudging him gently with her trunk. Some authors, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, wrote a book, and I think they were actually inspired by that exact same image because that looks to me a lot like the picture we just saw. Interestingly, Cass Sunstein is an animal rights person. He's actually a legal scholar but he has written some scholarly pieces on animal rights, and that actually stood in the way um, for him professionally. Um, I think the Obama campaign was trying to appoint him to some sort of official advisory position, and he was blocked. But anyways, he's still really um, an interesting legal mind, and he'll be speaking in Toronto later on this month. Um, if anybody wants to go to that, let me know, and I'll, I'll give you the details. Um, Richard Thaler is an economist, and the two of them teamed up to write a book that is very economically tilted, but it's the concept itself that I want to lean on now to make a few points. So let me define nudge in this context. So first, a really wordy, complicated definition. So nudges are ways of influencing choice without limiting the choice set or making alternatives appreciably more costly in terms of time, trouble, social sanctions, and so forth. They are called for because of flaws in individual uh, decision-making, and they work by making use of those flaws. So that was a recent um, article in Journal of Political Philosophy that wrote those words. Another interpretation, less wordy, maybe more to the point, Thaler and Sunstein's words. First, never, never underestimate the power of inertia Second, that power can be harnessed. And to reiterate this in even simpler words, maybe, is people are really, really lazy. And you can use that to advance social good. Okay, That's all nudging is, is recognizing that uh, lazy people like to stick with the default option. And so if you make the default option whatever you want it to be, that's typically what people will choose. 
And this has been applied in a whole bunch of different arenas, including organ donation. So for example, if um, you make it the default that when people go to renew their driver's license, they're automatically organ donors and they have the right to opt out, but that takes a little bit of trouble and effort, most people won't bother. And so organ donation rates can go up just by virtue of what you set the default as. So exploring this a little bit in a context we all care about, I think Meatless Monday is a useful thing to think about. And I know it's not um, you know, the strongest animal rights message we could make um, or take but, or promote, but it's interesting to, to consider, to think about the power it can have in um, altering people's behavior. So think about um, if you can get cafeterias, for example, to adopt Meatless Monday as kind of the default, like you know, in student meal plans, for example, if you're automatically given the meatless option unless you request otherwise, lots of people are lazy and they'll just stick with that default, even though you know, they might have normally chosen something different if they could just choose from a menu. If it's kind of the default option, that's the easiest thing to stick with. And I like that because it gets people on the veg slippery slope. You know, once they see veg food isn't yucky, they start to like it and maybe crave it. And once they see how easy it is, they start to explore other alternatives and, you know, maybe go meatless seven days a week or go vegan. So I like the idea of getting people onto um, that way of thinking. And related to this, Lots of organizations have sort of asked people to take pledges, either, you know, take a pledge to adopt Meatless Monday or take a pledge to go vegan for 60 days, um, various different options that are promoted by groups. And this can be a really powerful sort of commitment tool, getting people to make a promise to themselves that um, they, you know, are less likely to break if it's something that they've put in writing or they've promised to another individual or organization. Um, there's a really interesting variant on this I wanna highlight from the anti-smoking movement. There's a company um, or a not-for-profit, I'm not quite sure what they are, but they offer people an opportunity to quit smoking under really unique circumstances. So upfront, as the person is making their promise to quit smoking for six weeks, they have to put up $50. So let's envision this in a veg framework. Somebody makes a commitment to go to go vegan for 60 days. And let's say they have to give the Toronto Vegetarian Association $50 to hold on to for those 60 days. If they break their pledge, the charity keeps the money. If they don't break the pledge, they get the money back, but they're probably just going to let the charity keep the money anyways, right? Because that's easier. And who wants to take money back from a charity? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think, you know, thinking creatively about some of these ideas can lead to really novel sorts of applications. But that's just one example. Um, another one is actually based on where things get placed. And we see this in practice every time we go into a store. So big companies like Coca-Cola and Lay's pay huge, huge money to have their products placed where you can reach them and see them. And the companies that don't pay big bucks get their products placed way up here and way down here. So um, social scientists have been studying how to sort of generalize that behavior in marketing contexts to other contexts. So one study, looked at a cafeteria where there were two lineups. And in one of the lineups, they put lots of what they called healthy food options, easily accessible to people in the lineups. And what they found was they sold 18% more healthy food in that lineup than in the regular lineup, okay? And in another study, they, uh, this was probably looking at sort of a, a, like a salad bar type of arrangement. They made the, servings, the serving utensils, like the tongs or the spoons, a little hard to reach, like you had to sort of, you know, totter a little bit to reach them. When the utensils for particular foods were more difficult to reach, people consumed less of those particular foods and more of the foods that had easy to reach utensils. And um, the difference was 8 to 16%, which is pretty huge. 
Um, I have a little picture. The foods they considered healthy are not foods you or I would consider healthy. I'm okay with the broccoli, mushrooms, tomatoes, and cucumbers. Um, they were looking at um, some animal products as well, which um, you know is unfortunate, but the, the lesson to draw from this, I think, is um, you know, easily applied in more refined contexts. So what we see here is the, the yellow bar, which is always lower, is the case where the utensil was easy to reach. And um, there are statistical um, confidence bounds on this, and we can see in many cases the difference is statistically significant. So making those utensils harder to reach um, caused people to consume less of the foods that were being studied um, in this study, even though some of those items aren't really food. Okay, um, here is nudging uh, demonstrated in a Homer Simpson context. So here we have Apu behind the counter at the Quickie Mart, and he's got a pile of fruit here with the sign, healthy, fresh fruit, and the donuts are a little bit further back. And Homer's saying, Don't, the donuts are way over there, I think I'll have fruit. And Apu, the clever social scientist, is noticing, my cunning choice architecture will soon have Homer eating healthy. So this is a really simplistic demonstration of um, how the placement of items can really influence people's choices. And so, you know, this is, I think, something most of us haven't thought about trying to influence. We try to get maybe um, catering companies like Sodexo to, you know, stop using particular products or start carrying more veg products. But how about encouraging them to make them more easily accessible, like putting the, the vegan products, you know, in places where people make their impulse buys and getting rid of the non-vegan products and putting them somewhere else if we have to have them in there at all. So these are ways of maybe approaching some of these problems from a novel perspective that I don't think has been explored. Another concept I want to talk about <clears throat> is cognitive dissonance. And I'm sure you've all heard this expression before. It's a situation where somebody holds simultaneously two contradictory beliefs or points of view, and this creates a lot of emotional distress. And we can actually exploit that. And the um, Choose Veg campaign that Kimberly and I put together really tried to do that. So here's an example of um, one of the three images that we had running on the trauma subway system um, a couple of years ago. So we've got a juxtaposition here between two adorable animals, a dog and a cow, and we just asked the question, why love one but eat the other? And of course, this campaign is inspired by the original campaign by my hero, Henry Spira, his original, um, which do you love and which do you eat, why, which has been modified to be, who do you love, who do you eat, why? But if you've seen the image, it was a little, um, kitten and a piglet nose to nose. And it just, it's one of the earliest campaigns that I was exposed to when I was in my formative years as an activist. And it's always stayed with me. And it's been really neat to um, form a tribute to, to Henry Spira with this campaign. But my point is that we purposely put this conflict into the minds of the Toronto subway riders. And it's not enough to just introduce cognitive dissonance. You need to offer some kind of path towards resolution. And so the larger poster in its full form offered you know, disturbing images to just reinforce that cognitive dissonance and lots of facts about how smart cows are and how they're really not different from dogs and lots of facts about how the conditions under which cows are raised are awful. But then there's a path to resolution. Choose compassion, choose vegetarian, and a website, chooseveg.ca, where they could go to retrieve a, a vegetarian starter kit, a vegan starter kit, actually. And so this is just exploiting cognitive dissonance um, in hopes that we could influence people. And the campaign, um, we don't have formal statistics, but we do know that we got a lot of feedback from people who had never thought about being vegetarian before they had seen this image. And they contacted us through our website and sent us emails and described how, you know, whole families had gone vegetarian or um, just really big changes people were making, lots of requests for information. The campaign has been picked up in uh, some other countries 
And actually, next month it is going to launch across Canada in uh, Vancouver, Calgary, Winnipeg, Montreal, and Halifax. So this message is now um, really being spread to lots and lots of people, and we think it's been very influential. Okay, another concept I want to talk about, and I'm sorry, I'm bombarding you guys with information, and I'm going really, really fast. My goal is just to sort of pique your interest and um, give you some ideas, and hopefully afterwards we can you know, continue talking about this um, ongoing. I'm happy to talk to you guys you know, well into the future. Um, and I'm gonna point you to a book as well that elaborates on some of these concepts. But I just want you guys to get a sense of different ways to approach um, the way we think about spreading our message. And one, one item I wanna talk about is framing. So I wanna show you a couple of um, examples of the way the vegetarian message is often framed. And this I'm going to do with reference to the health benefits of a veg diet. So we often see new medical results coming out where it's really clear that if you just eat animal-based proteins and don't eat animal products, you actually will probably live longer. You'll face you know, lower risk of all sorts of health complications. And the way that we are typically informed of this is with a message like, a veg diet lowers heart disease risk by 32%. And even one of my heroes, T. Colin Campbell, who's done such amazing work in this area, he talks about it this way as well. I now consider veganism to be the ideal diet. A vegan diet, particularly one that is low in fat, will substantially reduce disease risks. All sounds good, right? These are all facts. It's nice to tell people that they'll be healthier if they just stop being cruel to animals, but I want you to think of a different way to frame this argument. So this is a screenshot from a just network news program in the US after the most recent story came out about um, the way bacteria in the gut interact with animal products and cause elevation in all sorts of health problems, especially uh, cardiovascular disease. So. Dangers of processed meats, risks when consuming over 160 grams per day, 44% more likely to die prematurely, risk of heart disease increased by 72%, risk of cancer increased by 11%. This is a very subtle difference. We're talking about how much you lose by eating meat. You eat meat, you're gonna die younger, you're gonna get more diseases, these are all bad things you want to avoid happening. These are all losses. These are all terrible, terrible things. The other arguments are pitched in terms of gains. You can live longer, you know. You, you'll get less likelihood of, of illness. And I think that the difference is really important. From a kind of technical, theoretical point of view, this relates to concepts called loss aversion and prospect theory. Prospect theory is a notion that was developed by two psychologists, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Kahneman got a Nobel Prize a few years ago. They really um, showed that reference points matter. And whether you're talking about gaining relative to a reference point or losing relative to a reference point is important language differences. So we always compare how we're gonna be doing in life relative to where we're at right now, okay? Like, this is kind of status quo. And when you think about pitching the argument of going veg or not going veg relative to what these guys have discovered, um, the concept of loss aversion becomes really important. Loss aversion says that losses are a much bigger deal than gains. And what I mean by that is, um, if you talk about somebody losing something, it can be a sum of money or um, something traumatic happening in their life, that event is two to two and a half times more painful than the similar upside thing happening, getting that same amount of money or like the positive version of whatever the loss was happening. So this is really, really well established in psychology, so much that you know um, Kahneman was recognized by the Nobel Committee for this and it's prevalent. It really applies in all sorts of contexts. And I think especially in this kind of context of 
you know, promoting veganism, we can really exploit it. If we talk about what people have to lose by continuing to eat meat, that is way more powerful than talking about what they stand to gain by stopping. Okay, so think about that asymmetry, talking about, you know, how much less healthy people can be if they're going to continue <coughs> eating meat versus the, the same argument pitched in terms of the health benefits. So I think that's really cool. Okay, um, related to this, here's another ad that is pitching um, the go veg argument in terms of health. <coughs> This is sort of pitching this argument the way that I'm kind of advocating. Warning, hot dogs can wreck your health. We're talking about the loss to your health. Um, the other point I want to make about this ad, though, is related to a cognitive shortcut that our brains take that's called the representativeness heuristic. It's a tendency that we have to generalize about a situation based on our past experiences or similarities to other experiences. And so this particular ad is exploiting representativeness by saying eating hot dogs or meat in general is just like smoking. Notice the graphic here. We've got a bunch of hot dogs coming out of something that looks like a cigarette package. It's got sort of the kind of font and imagery that we see that we associate with tobacco and they're making an association here we all accept that that smoking is terrible for your health they're drawing the analogy saying you know eating meat is comparable to smoking and it's relying on our brain to take this shortcut we just see the image and we think oh yeah meat tobacco all that so that's exploiting this little laziness of our brain um, in a positive way, trying to um, advocate for uh, social change that is good. Okay. So, you know, I've given you lots and lots of examples. I think that there are other ways to apply these kinds of results in um, more settings than I've talked about in, in the articles that uh, Paul posted. I think um, one was about vivisection, and I was sort of using the social conformity tool to try to convey the idea that among many medical professionals, there is an increasing view that animal testing is not acceptable. And so trying to encourage medical professionals to keep moving in that direction. Look, your peers are also adopting this view. You should think about it as well. Um, in the Choose Veg campaign, we also used the social conformity sort of pressure by making explicit reference to people's community. So at the bottom of the ad, we had a message uh, brought to you by Concerned Citizens of Toronto. So this isn't some, you know, nefarious organization off in the ether. This is your fellow citizens who have come together to bring you this message. And that can be really powerful, thinking about members of your community holding this point of view and applying it um, for good in that way. So, you know, we could go on brainstorming, and I would really like it if we did. Um, those are just a few things that come to mind for me right now, a few tools that I hope that give you a little tiny taste of this, this area. And it's really, really new, applying these kinds of ideas in a formal way to the kinds of activism that we're all engaged in. It can be applied to social activism of all sorts, but um, there's a book that was written just very recently, I just came across it, called Change of Heart, and it talks about a lot of these ideas. So um, Nick Cooney is the author, and the subtitle is What Psychology Can Teach Us About Spreading Social Change, and refreshingly, this book, although its cover talks about social change, inside is all about animal rights activism. So <laughs> for once, the false advertising is working in our favor. So I encourage you to check out this book if this topic interests you at all. Um, I really enjoyed dabbling in the book myself. So that's about the end of my formal content. I thank you for your wonderful attention and um, the one question I was allowed to field, I'm happy to take more questions and I've been instructed to repeat the question before I answer it, which I will definitely do. So thank you all.